I have often puzzled and puzzled about what it must be like to go to sleep and never wake up, to be simply not there forever and ever. After all, one has some intimation of this by the interval that separates going to sleep from waking. When we don't have any dreams, but go to sleep, and then suddenly we're there again, and in the interim, there was nothing. And if there was never any end to that interval, if the waking up didn't happen, that's such a curious thought. And yet, you know, I believe that thou, although that's rather gloomy kind of consideration, I found that's one of the most creative thoughts I ever thought in my life. And I keep going back to it. You know, it's in line with a lot of the very fundamental questions that children ask. When they say, Mommy, who would I have been if you had married someone else? These are the kind of questions that make us puzzle profoundly about our existence. And one of the reasons why I think thinking about not being, about total non-existence, is so creative, is that in comparison with that thought, the fact that we are seems kind of queer, incredibly odd. But you know, in the Western world, I suppose we have two dominant ideas about what happens to us when we die. There's the old-fashioned idea that after we die, we go to another world. I say old-fashioned, not to say it's out of date. We don't know what the answer to this is. But that's the traditional answer of the Western world. When you die, you go to another life, maybe heaven, Maybe purgatory, maybe hell, who knows. I think nowadays though, the more general idea, the more plausible idea to many people, is that when we die, we just cease to be. That's all there is to it. But we're inclined, I think, to have in our minds a picture of this, which indeed is depressing, of being shut up in the dark for always and always and always, to be kind of buried alive in a black where we are blind, deaf, and dumb, but somehow still conscious. But in the Eastern world, there are different ideas of this. The major Eastern idea is what is generally known as reincarnation, of going through life after life after life in an endless series. Now, of course, when any idea like that is explained, the first thing that we ask is, is it true? Is there a process of rebirth? But you know, as this idea is held by deeply thoughtful Hindus and Buddhists, it isn't a belief in something which we can't prove. It's really quite a self-evident notion. Think of it in this way. Supposing I make two statements. Statement one, after I die, I shall be reborn again as a baby, but I shall forget my former life. Statement two, after I die, a baby will be born. Now, I believe that those two statements are saying exactly the same thing. And we know that the second one is true. Babies are always being born. Conscious beings of all kinds are constantly coming into existence after others die. But why would I think that the two statements are really the same statement? Because after all, if you die and your memory comes to an end and you forget who you were, being reborn again is exactly the equivalent of somebody else being born. 
because we have no consciousness of our continuity unless we have memory. If the memory goes, then we might just as well be somebody else. But it seems to me that the fascinating thing about this is that although a particular set of memories vanishes, death is not the end of consciousness. In other words, we are deluded by a kind of fantasy. If we think of death as endless darkness, endless nothingness is not only inconceivable, but it's logically absolutely meaningless because we aren't able to have any idea, much less sensation of nothing, unless it can be compared with a sensation of something. These two things go together. And therefore, I think what is meant is that the vacuum created by the disappearance of a being, by the disappearance of his memory system, is simply filled by another being who is I, just as you feel you are I. The funny thing though about being I, about feeling that one is sort of a center of the universe, is that you can only experience this I sensation in the singular. You can't experience being two or three eyes all at the same time. Now then, it seems to me that this idea has three very important consequences. One is that the disappearance of our memory in death is not really something to be regretted. Of course, everybody wishes to hold forever to the memories and to the people and the situations that he particularly loves. But surely, if we think this through, is that what we actually want? Do we really want to have those we love, however greatly we love them, for always and always and always and always? Isn't it inconceivable that even in a very distant future, we wouldn't get tired of it? And this indeed is the secret of the thing. This is why the demon of impermanence is beneficent. Because it is forgetting about things that renews their wonder. Just think, when you opened your eyes on the world for the first time as a child, how brilliant colors were, what a jewel the sun was, what marvels the stars, how incredibly alive the trees were. That's all because they were new to your eyes. Or in the same way you know how it is you've been reading a mystery story. And uh, you're looking around the house, you want something to read, and you pick up an old mystery story. If you read it years and years ago and you've forgotten all about the plot, it still excites you. But if you remember the plot, it doesn't excite you. And so, by the dispensation of forgetting, the world is constantly renewed. And we are able to see it again and again, and to love again and again, to have people to whom we are deeply attached and deeply fond, always with renewed intensity and without the contrast of having seen them before, 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 but always and always and always. Another consequence of this is a very curious realization to me. Remember that question, who would I be if my mother had married someone else? Who, if I were you, we often say, one might so easily have been you. I might so easily have been born in China and India. Why do I feel that the world is centered in this place as distinct from some other place? You jolly well know the world is centered where you are. And this gives one a very strange feeling of the idea that other people jolly well exist in the same sense you do. Everybody's name is I. That's what you call yourself. So, there will always be eyes in the world. Every eye is in a way the same eye. We all might be anyone else. And there is no escape. It goes on and on and on and on. So long as there is consciousness anywhere, there is I. You then...